I, I feel like I'm a pretty decent writer. I'm not a great reader. And I feel kind of awkward just opening up a book and reading it. So I decided I'm going to do something different on a book tour. And so what I did is I'm also a photographer, is I took photos uh, from that first book, uh, you know, of, of different animals that I saw, different adventures uh, my wife and I had, and put together kind of, a, it was like a 30-minute slideshow, and I would narrate that. And I think that's kind of where I got the storytelling, because I wanted to have stories behind it. Uh, so my whole idea was to make the book tour more interesting than the author just sitting there and reading a book. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 211 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have a conversation with Marty Essen, the author of several nonfiction and fiction titles and a much sought after public speaker. Marty's first book, Cool Creatures Hot Planet, Exploring the Seven Continents, won six national awards and the Minneapolis Star Tribune named it a top 10 green book. His second book, Endangered Edens, Exploring the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Costa Rica, the Everglades, and Puerto Rico, won four national awards. His three novels in the Time is Irreverent series have all received rave reviews. Hits Heathens and Hippos is Marty's sixth book, and like all of his books, it reflects his values of protecting human rights and the environment. And he does so with a wry sense of humor, which you're going to hear in the forthcoming episode. Now, Marty is also a popular college speaker, which you're also going to hear about, and he has performed the stage show version of Cool Creatures Hot Planet on hundreds of campuses in 45 states, and that's just one of the cool things that we have a chance to talk about. And that interview is coming up later in the podcast. But first, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that is author-friendly and allows authors the opportunity to get their audiobook out into the market. Whether you're looking for a professional narrator or you already have an audio file that's ready to go, you can leverage Findaway Voices. What I love about Findaway Voices is the platform is flexible. So if you're looking for a narrator, they'll help you find one from a platform or network of thousands of narrators around the world. Now, not only, it's not just an open RFP process, but they actually have a process that involves a project manager who will help you find, usually they narrow it down to between five and 10 of the people that they think would be best suited for you. And it's based on the criteria you put in as well as different price ranges. So they understand that authors need to be sensitive to that. And that's what I love about Findaway Voices is the choice and the options. There's always new options. There's always new things to explore. If you have the audiobook file yourself, you can use Findaway Voices for distribution. And you have the control. You can decide where you want to distribute. They have more than 43 retail and library markets around the world. But you can choose where you want to go. If you're already using some of them directly, for example, you can use Findaway Voices. They also have some really cool marketing tools that are available through Findaway Voices and an exclusive relationship with Chirp, owned by BookBub. If you're looking for control of your audiobook empire as an author or small publisher, look no further than Findaway Voices. And if you want to learn more about how you can leverage Findaway Voices to find your way in the audiobook market, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now for some comments from recent episodes. So uh, first comment is uh, for episode 207, which was uh, my uh, talk on library and bookstore strategies. Regina Clark says, hey, do you happen to have, uh, she didn't say hey, she said hi, but I just, I'm sorry, Regina, I, I retranslated that into hey. I hope that's okay. Uh, that, that, that We'll call that... Um, 
poetic license. Yes, yes, I was just, I was editorializing. It felt more like you're like, hey, hey, Mark, how's it going? Uh, okay, back to Regina's actual comment. Hi, do you by chance have a transcript of episode 207? Uh, Regina, thank you so much for asking that. Now, I have done uh, transcripts of some of the episodes, and I'll admit, uh, since this is a one-man operation, uh, I take the transcripts. I run them through Descript. Uh, th those are the folks who have my uh, audio, uh, my voice, uh, my voice double on file. And uh, usually because I'm so behind uh, in getting this done on a weekly basis, it's that extra step that takes an extra probably half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, but because you're awesome and I love you, uh, I love all my listeners, of course, uh, I'm going to run a transcript through. And hopefully sometime, this, this episode goes live on uh, Friday, September 17th. So hopefully if you go back to starkreflections.ca and you check out episode 207, uh, Regina, um, there should be a transcript there. A rough transcript, again, because it's not human edited at all. Uh, I run it through, it's it's computer generated, so there's going to be weird mistakes and stuff like that. But at least get, we'll give you the, uh, hopefully, uh, the gist of that if you prefer to read it rather than listening to my droning voice. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for asking. And, and I would like to do more transcripts for more of my episodes. Uh, if, if only I, I had things... Uh, done early enough that I could uh, schedule them in. Well, we'll get there eventually. We'll get there. And uh, again, but thank you, Regina, for a comment like that, because that helps me understand that uh, uh, my listeners do uh, appreciate the transcripts. I, I was originally trying to do them to help uh, with the SEO uh, for the website because of all the content and the, and the and, you know, the, the, the words that are spoken. And I usually only transcribe the interview portion uh, rather than my rambling at the beginning and at the end. But thanks, Regina. And anyone else who's interested in transcripts, just poke me, let me know. It's it's not that hard, just takes a little bit of time for me to do, but I'm happy to do that to help you guys uh, so you can enjoy the content in the format that you prefer. Uh, other comment that came in, uh, Stanley B. Trice um, left this comment um, for episode 210, Facing Creative Block with Morgan Rhodes, which was uh, from uh, last week's episode. And Stanley says, I enjoyed listening to Morgan Rhodes, or Michelle Rowan, because she writes under both names, uh, talk about her writing life and discovery. A famous blogger mentioned, there is no such thing as writer's block. Maybe writer's block isn't so much uh, as a block, but uh, time to take a break. Just a little break, like taking a deep breath and exhaling slowly. That's a great comment, Stanley, and and I'm I'm with you on that. I've often uh, I've often joked uh, the, the joke I like to say when people say about writer's block is I say, well, I don't believe in writer's block, and therefore it doesn't believe in me. But that's just me being a bit of a smartass. What I like to say is that um, when writer's block happens, when I'm blocked, when I'm having difficulty with a scene, I do exactly what you said there that you're referencing a blogger that said time to take a break. Because oftentimes, I often think it's my imagination or my muse or whatever telling me something's wrong. I just can't see it and I'm having trouble with it. And so often stepping back, doing something else, uh, whether it's working on something else at my desk or whether it's going and, and uh, doing a chore or taking the dogs for a walk or going for a run or do something different, uh, put my head puts my head in a different space, which sometimes allows me to see more clearly and see past that block or see through that block, or understand what it was that was causing that block. And, uh, or like you say, you take a deep breath and exhale slowly. Uh, so uh, great advice uh, on, on ways of dealing with that. I'd be curious, uh, you, you dear listener, all you dear listeners, not just Stanley, but everyone who's <laughs> listening, uh, what are your thoughts on, on writer's block? What are the tips? Uh, what are the suggestions? How do you overcome that? Maybe that's, uh, that can be a topic for a forthcoming episode where I can just have some uh, uh, cool uh, advice and tips uh, from my, uh, my awesome listening community. I would be curious because it, it is something that, um, uh, that we love to talk about, whether it exists or not and how we deal with it uh, when it hits us uh, or when something like that hits us. But thank you, Stanley, and thank you, uh, Regina, for leaving comments. You can leave comments for this podcast over at starkreflections.ca. You can email me directly, mark at marklesley.ca. You, you can also leave comments over uh, on, on Twitter at Mark Leslie, and sometimes I will get to them. The Twitter sphere has been quite busy uh, with excitement uh, about um, 
the book I have coming out with Joanna Penn, the relaxed author, and lots of lots of stuff uh, where uh, Lindsay Broker uh, was uh, potentially um, wondering if Joanna and I would come on the Six Figure Author podcast. We would have a five way conversation, and that would be Joanna, myself, and Lindsay. And uh, Joe Lalo and uh, Andrea Pearson, uh, a great, great group of people. I just I respect uh, all of them so tremendously, and that would be just so wonderful conversation. So uh, look for that. I'll have links to that, and I'll talk about it in the forthcoming episode because it looks like we're going to do it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, speaking of Joanna, I'm just going to roll right into my personal update. Oh, well, well, let, let, let's have the sounder. Ah, nothing like a good sounder. Uh, okay, so over, uh, you see, see how I, I did, I did kind of try to move from one into another. We call that a transition, right? That's the word I was looking for. But yeah, uh, Joe and I recorded a special episode for the Creative Pen Podcast and for Stark Reflections, and, and that's coming up very soon because our book comes out on uh, the 18th. Oh my God, that's only, well, um, tomorrow from the day that this goes live or in just a couple days, September 18th, 2000. In 21, the relaxed author will be out in print, in ebook, and the audiobook is going to be probably live at some places and not others as it slowly gets uh, rolled out into the stratosphere. We are uh, publishing it through Findaway Voices, and it can get to some places quickly and other places not so quickly. So you can find it at your favorite retailer. You can also uh, request it at the library in whatever format uh, you prefer. So that's going to be exciting. That was a really fascinating conversation with Joe. And uh, I think I mentioned, uh, did I do this in the last episode or not, uh, where there's a video of an excerpt from the audiobook uh, featuring Joe's voice and my voice, of course, because we narrate the audiobook with a bit of a slideshow of 10 years of, of selfies and pictures that Joe had taken all over the place, uh, all over the world, uh, or at least on uh, two continents that, uh, that uh, we'd been hanging out on. So that, that was kind of a fun thing to do. So I've got that coming up, uh, ramping up the uh, release for the relaxed author. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm thrilled um, that that's happening, but we're not doing anything major for it. You know, we're just doing some sort of relaxed uh, stuff. It's more of a long-term thing uh, that we want to uh, put out there and help authors with. I have been so busy as well with interviews and content uh, through my publicist, Mickey, who uh, sending out a press release about the relaxed author as well as um, publishing pitfalls for authors. And uh, even though I'm, I'm sad that I won't be going to Uh, A couple of the conferences I was really excited about going to, the uh, Career Author Summit with Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon. Uh, I'm not going to be there, uh, which is this weekend, and I was supposed to be a speaker there, and I I felt really bad that I had to to back out of that travel. But also that same trip would have seen me going uh, from Nashville first uh, at the Career Author Summit to Novelist Inc. in St. Pete, uh, Florida, and I had to cancel both those. And unfortunately, uh, sad to say, I do still have some uh, travel to the U.S. later this year in November. I'm a keynote speaker at um, the Liberty uh, State Writers Conference in New Jersey. I'm doing a two-hour keynote talk. I'm so thrilled and excited about that. It's a one-day conference, and I'm just honored uh, that they wanted me there for that. And uh, and then I, I fly right out to Vegas because um, 20 books... Vegas starts right after that. So that'll be interesting. Uh, getting back to Canada will be an interesting thing. But um, I mean, unless they completely shut down the borders and do not let Canadians in, because I have business reasons to be there, uh, I'll definitely uh, I'll be at both of those events. And speaking of Jay and Zach, I, uh, I just today, earlier today, recorded um, uh, a patron um, episode of the podcast, uh, Stark Reflections on other podcasts, which is one of the features I do for my uh, patrons. And what uh, what I was talking about was the most recent episode of the um, um, Writers Inc. podcast. That's uh, Jay Thorne with J.D. Barker and Zach Bohannon. And uh, they always interview someone fascinating. And it was a great, great interview with Hugh Howie. And so I excerpted about uh, maybe seven or eight minutes of a conversation with Hugh and I reflected uh, on that, and um, I, I, it, it was it was it was great to hear the two of them in conversation. And so, with a special thank you to my awesome patrons, 
uh, you should find that in your audio feed uh, for uh, your Patreon audio feed for Stark Reflections podcast. And again, it's it's only about a 20 minute uh, episode because you've got the um, about half of it is the content from the original podcast. And then, of course, my rambling uh, reflections on that, including errors that I did not cut or edit out of the video because, you know, patrons get that special content get to see me with the, the kimono open yeah like who wants that <laughs> anyways but a special thank you to all my patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections where for a dollar two dollars or five dollars a month gets you access to different content so at the one dollar level you get a high five a you know a big air hug a virtual hug from me uh and uh and a link on the web on the website um, uh, and then at the two and five dollar uh, a month level, you get access to additional content, which is the audio content, some other content that I post as well as videos, etc. But thank you to all my patrons and thank you to all my listeners. But I'm I'm just rambling. Uh, so enough of the rambling, shall we? Why don't we get into this uh, fascinating conversation with Marty Essen? Hey Marty, welcome to the Start Reflections podcast. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. It is, uh, it's really fun to get to talk to you, particularly after having watched uh, some of your storytelling ex- escapades. But before, before we get into that, uh, okay. I want to go back to uh, why storytelling has, uh, it seems like it's always been important to you, or it seems like you're a natural at it. But where did, where did that all start? I, you know, I don't know. I've been told I'm a natural at it. I never felt like I was. Uh, but it just, it happened with my first book, Cool Creatures, Hot Planet, Exploring the Seven Continents. And uh, for that book, you know, I had written for magazines, I had written for newspapers before. Right, yeah. And uh, I had never written a book. And uh, so I, I went out and I found the best editor I could find, uh, right. a woman by the name of Lori Rosen out of Florida. Uh, she's edited like 48 New York Times bestselling books. Okay. And I started working with her. And one of those things where I thought I was really hot shit because I had written for all the, these newspapers and magazines and didn't realize how different it was for a book. Yeah. And so I sent her the first three chapters and thinking I would get um, a return from her saying, oh, this is just, this is so perfect other than this one comma right here. Fix that comma and it's perfect. And instead I got this... It was like a, I was just red marks all over the place. <laughs> and I really realized how much I needed to learn. And uh, because it was so different, because uh, my first book, which is Cool Creatures, Hot Planet, Exploring the Seven Continents. And what it is, is my wife, Deb, and I, we travel to all seven continents looking for rare and interesting wildlife. Okay. So if I was writing, in fact, uh, behind me over on one side, you, uh, there is, a newspaper article I wrote, which was the first thing that came out uh, on my travels that, that uh, was pretty basic. But if I'm writing for a newspaper, if I step into the rainforest, I'm just going to say I step into the rainforest. But if you're writing for a book, you need to tell the, the reader what it smells like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, all of that. So through her, it was more than just having an editor. It was like taking a master class in writing. <laughs> and so I think that helped me out. I mean, it helped me out tremendously right. uh, to work with her. And I think I caught on fairly quickly. Um, and then when I went out on my first book tour, uh, I, I feel like I'm a pretty decent writer. I'm not a great reader. And I feel kind of awkward just opening up a book and reading it. So I decided I want to do something different on a book tour. And so what I did is I'm also a photographer, is I took photos uh, from that first book, uh, you know, of, of different animals that I saw, different adventures uh, my wife and I had, and put together kind of, a, it was like a 30-minute slideshow, and I would narrate that, and I think that's kind of where I got the storytelling, because I wanted to have stories behind it, uh, so my whole idea was to make the book tour more interesting than the author just sitting there and reading a book, and, and then from there, uh, that ended up becoming my college show, around the world in 90 minutes, which I've now been doing at colleges. This is my 15th year of speaking at campuses from coast to coast. And I've spoken on hundreds of campuses in 45 states. So that's kind of where the storytelling has come from because it just happened naturally, I guess. 
that's interesting. I love the fact that you play to your strengths there. You're like, you know, I'm not, I'm not like not comfortable doing the reading out loud. It's kind of boring. Someone's standing there reading a lot from a book. You, well, you made it into like a multidimensional interactive experience. Well, yeah, it's, it's like with my audio books too. I don't do the audio myself. Uh, I, I hire people that can do all the voices and everything. Right. Uh, that's, that's not my strong point. So yeah. um, now, uh, it was your first book that won so many awards, wasn't it? Yeah, it uh, it won uh, six different awards. The most prestigious one uh, was the uh, Benjamin Franklin Award. Wow! Uh, which is um, through the um, IPB, IPPA, uh, Independent Book Publishers Association. Right. And that was kind of fun because it was at done at Book Expo uh, in New York City. So we flew out to Book Expo, and and I had you know I knew I was one of the top three, but I didn't think I was going to win. Wow. And so it was just a, it was just this complete surprise that the book won. And so that was a lot of fun. But I've got a kind of funny story that goes along with this that I actually talk about in my latest book, Hits, Heathens and Hippos, is after I won that award and the award was this big honking award. It weighs about four weighs about four pounds made out of glass. Okay. And after I won that award, I'm really high after winning it and the awards are over and people start coming up and talking to me. And, uh, and so I'm sharing different stories and, uh, I talk a lot with my hands <laughs> and so I'm telling the story and I go open my arms up wide and I nail a woman right in the eye with the corner of the award. Oh my God. She covers her eye and this blood starts coming down, uh, her cheek. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I put this woman's eye out and, and she starts crying and very beautiful woman. And, you know, all of a sudden my life passed before me. I'm going to get sued for everything I have. Uh, you know, you, I couldn't have possibly gone from a higher high to a lower low in, in a half a second. Fortunately, you know, we, we finally got her to take her hand off. And there was just this little teeny, teeny cut on her cheek. Uh, but cuts on cheeks just bleed like hell. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then we were in the Javits Center and it's like, can you find a Band-Aid in the Javits Center? <laughs> you know, we looked all over the place. Finally, we found some woman that, that ha had a Band-Aid in, in her purse, and we got the woman all uh, fixed up, and she was just fine and smiling by the, by the end. But that was some experience from going from, from, from winning a, an award to almost putting a woman's eye out by accident. Wow. Wow. Did, have you stayed in touch with her at all? No. <laughs> No, in fact, well, you know, because you always wonder, it's like, okay, well, maybe later, what if she comes back? And so I, I hope, luckily, now it's, it's been a while, so I haven't heard from her, so I don't think I'm going to get sued. Good news. And, and the, the blood stain on the edge of the, edge of the, of the award is still there. <laughs> uh, no, you, you, you alluded to this earlier, but I want to get into the fact that you started, so it was with Gig Magazine. Yeah, and you were writing music? Is that what it was? Well, yeah, I, I grew I, I'm in Montana now. That's where I'm talking to you from, from Montana, just a little south of Missoula on the far western side of Montana. But I grew up in Minnesota. And uh, uh, I was born in Duluth, and uh, I was the youngest disc jockey in the history of Minnesota. Uh, and I think that, that's going to stand forever because... I, I basically went on the air when I turned 16 right. uh, and I had been working at the radio station before doing volunteer work. That's kind of how I had my in. Right. Uh, but I ended up then at a different radio station uh, in Duluth that used to be a country Western radio station. And they changed the format and changed the call letters to KQDS. It became this progressive rock station. And it was one of the most influential small market radio stations in the country. I mean, we were the first on bands like U2 and Blondie, uh, you know, all of the, the bands that were coming up in the early 80s. And the ma general manager they brought in, uh, his name was Mark Allen. And he used to be uh, the manager for Tommy James and the Shondells. Yep. And he was also the U.S. agent for The Who. And uh, so the radio station in three years went up to number one. And as soon as it went to number one, the, the, the um, company fired the general manager because they didn't want to pay him all that money. And so I talked him into, well, let's, let's start another talent agency. So he and I and another person formed a partner, partnership. We moved him to uh, Minneapolis. Right. And for 11 years, I managed rock and roll and contemporary jazz acts. And uh, the gig magazine just came from, I, had, I approached, it used to be, it, the magazine's no longer around anymore. But it used to be the magazine that every time I would go into a dressing room 
at a nightclub uh, or backstage any place, there was always a copy of Gig Magazine. Okay. And so I approached Gig Magazine about writing an article and they wrote me back immediately said, well, we'd like you to write three feature articles, uh, front, <laughs> uh, front cover articles. So that was my, my start at writing was for Gig Magazine. And unfortunately, it's shortly after I wrote those articles, the magazine went out of business, but it was a really good magazine. Right. And, and that kind of uh, was shortly after that, as I understand it, that it was you telling a reporter you're about to go on an Amazon expedition that they said, wait a minute. <laughs> Can you exactly. write something? You, you got it right. Yeah. yeah. And that's how the book started. My first book is, is uh, I, I, out here in Montana, I, for 19 years, I ran an independent telephone company. And when it was our 10th year for the telephone company, the newspaper came out and interviewed me. And after the interview, I walked the reporter to the door, shook his hand and said, I'll see you. I'm heading down to the Amazon rainforest. And he said, really, do you want to write a story about it? And, and that actually turned into a story for the Amazon. And then later on, we went down to Australia and it became a story for Australia. And what would happen is if I went out into a supermarket or into a restaurant, people would recognize me from the author photo. And they'd come up and say, wow, we love that story. Are you going to write another one? And, uh, at that point, I did a little research and uh, found out that no one had ever written a book on the concept of travel to all seven continents looking for rare and interesting wildlife. And so I made that my theme wow. and uh, we continued our travels. We went to all seven continents in three and a half years. And uh, that became my first book and it became the show that I'm still doing at colleges all over the country. So I am a huge fan uh, and, and I know you're into uh, the environment uh, uh -huh, that's important, yes. uh, uh, is, is re recycling uh, content uh, for authors because your IP, your intellectual property can be leveraged in multiple ways, which you're already doing, yeah. obviously the talks and the books, yeah. but it almost feels like, was it that, and, and I know there's a difference between article writing and chapter writing, because there is, yeah. as you explained uh, a little bit earlier, but was that a possibility where when you were traveling, Obviously, there's some travel expenses you can write off, but you're, you're, you're potentially writing articles and features for different magazines. And then that same research can turn into part of the book. Is, is that how you did it? Well, yeah, I mean, I was doing it for the book and, and I didn't actually put any, uh, uh, send any of those to magazines. Uh, I did some other stories that became in a second book. Uh, my follow up book was a book called Endangered Edens exploring the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Costa Rica. Uh, uh, I always forget, forget Exploring the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Costa Rica, the Everglades in Puerto Rico. And this one, I actually did some recycling. Uh, my Puerto Rico story, uh, a part of that, uh, we went into this really remote area of Puerto Rico and found in a cave, um, what are uh, Puerto Rican boas. And they're a snake that they live on the side of the cave. And what they do is it, there's all these bats that come out of the cave. And uh, so what, what the snakes would do is as the bats would fly out of the cave, they strike out and they grab them. And so we sat there at the edge of the cave as these bats are going right by us, thousands upon thousands of them, and I'm taking photos. And then that became... Uh, not only a, a chapter in my book, but it also became an article in Reptiles magazine. So that time I did, I did do that. And now in my latest book, uh, which is uh, I, my, going back to nonfiction called Hits, Heathens, and Hippos, Stories from an Agent, Activist, and Adventure, which is basically a memoir, uh, I did borrow some stories from my first book and put it into my sixth book. Right. Uh, I kind of rewrote it a little bit. You know, you, I'm a better writer than I was when I wrote that first book. So I kind of fixed <laughs> them up a little bit. Yeah. But I've kind of recycled them for just a couple chapters in my latest book. Because okay. I, I can imagine, especially when, you, when you're touring and you potentially return to the same college as before, where there's someone who says, oh, can you please share this story? It's one of my favorites. Do you, you must get those, right? Well, you know, my actually no, because my story, when I do a show, it's exactly the same okay. uh, every single time because uh, I'm when, when I speak at a college, I wear a headset microphone and I don't I don't stand by at a lectern. And uh, so I'm on a wide open stage. Right. And I actually use my rock and roll experience to put together this show, because one of the things I did as a rock and roll manager 
is we would put together stage shows for our bands on how they would move on stage. And so I tried to take that rock and roll excitement and put it into my show. So there's times I'm crawling on the floor, <laughs> I'm running across the stage. Uh, there's all these fun things that are going on. And I rehearsed it and rehearsed it. I mean, it's to the point where at, I, I say the exact same word on the exact same step on stage. Okay. And so it's everything is exactly the same. I've made a few adjustments uh, throughout the years. If I, if I have a story that doesn't go over quite well, as well as some of the others, I might pull that out and put a new one in. But basically, 99% of it stays the same. And you know, sometimes people ask me, well, do you ever get bored of doing the same stories hundreds of times? And I actually don't because I have a challenge for myself, which I have not done yet. And that is to do a perfect show. Because, uh, you know, it's really hard to have 90 minutes totally memorized and to do it perfectly without a single stammer, without a single mistake. Right. Now, I can generally do the show where no one will ever know I made a mistake, but I will know I made the mistake. Yeah. And so that's my ongoing goal. And what keeps me going is to do the perfect show without a single mistake. <laughs> and I, I still haven't done that. I've gotten close, but I haven't done it. It sounds uh, fact, Go ahead. <laughs> Well, it just sounds like with uh, like I have a background in theater. And so that would be, well, there's actually the stage direction and the blocking that you have to get down pat that go in line with where you're going to be when you deliver this line, where you're going to be looking, how you're going to be gesturing, whatever. Uh, but it feels like it, no different than what in theater is called a one hander, which is a, a one man show where uh -huh. you are there and you are performing as yourself, obviously, but you're performing content from the books you've written. But yeah. you're doing it very consistently, very methodically, because your goal is to entertain and inspire and inform, right? Exactly. And, exactly. and that script and that blocking. Uh, now, did you get, uh, did you have, obviously, you know, in theater, there's always uh, external people that are giving you stage direction and, and notes on that? Or did that just come organically over That's, time? Well, I used to be in theater when I was in high school. So, okay. <laughs> uh, I, and, and, you know, doing the rock and roll bands. I did it. I put it all together myself, but I just, you know, set up a a basically a theater in my basement to practice wow. and here, here's something that might help people out who are going public speaking because you know i had been in radio and i've spoken you know, to you know thousands of people at the time never got nervous but i had stage fright and uh, most people have stage fright when you're when you're public speaking and i came up with something that worked for me and i've never heard anybody else do it but as I was practicing the show, and, I, and especially when you're getting paid, because college is paid pretty good money. And so it was a whole different thing between doing a show in a bookstore for free and then doing a more elaborate show where colleges are paying me thousands of dollars. I want to make sure it's perfect. And so how I overcame stage fright is in my basement as I practice in my practice room, I put the brightest lights on me right in my eyes that I could possibly put in. And it worked. I, in fact, the first time I did my basement, I got nervous because it felt like I was under spotlights. Right. And that solved my stage fright. I mean, I still, you know, I, now I still get a little bit, but it's the good stage fright. The, right, right. You know, that gives you the energy. energy. It, it's not the, my mind is going to go blank and I'm not going to know what to say next. Right. Uh, but so that's how I overcame stage fright was by putting bright lights in my eyes as I practiced. So as you practice, I was thinking when you put the bright lights in your eyes, it's great because you can't see the audience. <laughs> well, you know, in every you know, every college is, it has different lighting. You know, sometimes I can see the audience really well and sometimes I can't. Uh, it just depends on, on the college. <laughs> oh, cool. So can you talk a little bit about I want to I want to get into the logistics of publishing, like how you found sure. a publisher, how you went okay. about the process. Yeah. But I want to because we're talking about the stage and I love the, uh, the theatrical storytelling aspect of it mm -hmm. is you talked about, uh, you know, college. Uh, how did you get into the college scene? How did you get your foot in that uh, academic door? Well, it goes back to being a talent agent. Uh, we would book our my company. We would book our bands not only in nightclubs and in and in fairs and venues all over, but there's also the college market. And so I knew the college market existed and it was just a matter of figuring out how to do it. And um, there are two college organizations, NACA called NACA yep. and then APCA, APCA. And they 
through them, you know, they do these conferences where they have speakers come in and they have comedians and they have jugglers and they have bands, they have everybody. And so I got involved with them initially. Uh, I'm no longer involved with them because I don't need them anymore. Uh, but the toughest thing was putting together a, a list of colleges. And, you know, when you join NACA, you join APCA, you get a college list, but I found them to be outdated and very incomplete. So what I do basically every summer, uh, I take a, a month and all I do is I research colleges. And I go to every website of every college in the United States uh, and I recheck to make sure that I have the proper contact. Uh, and then I use emails. Uh, and uh, so I've got, I've got a, I, I think I have the best American college list in the world because I can't believe anybody does what I do. And I'm really, it's, and sometimes it's really hard to find email addresses because they hide them. Yep. And I've, I've learned how to kind of decipher, it's like, and to figure things out. And, and I can find almost anybody's email address. So anyway, so I send out emails and, and I not only represent myself, uh, but I represent um, Traciana Graves out of New York City, who is a civility speaker. I uh, represent Naomi Grossman, who is uh, plays Pepper in American Horror Story. Yeah. And I represent Demona Hoffman, who is on the Drew Barrymore show. Uh, and so I also book them. And so, you know, once a week, I send out emails to uh, roughly 5,000 college campuses or college contacts. Sometimes there's more than one. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'll send out an email with links to videos and that sort of thing. And that's how I get the gigs. And then the colleges will contact me back and say, hey, we're looking for somebody for such and such a date. Are you available or is Demona Hoffman available? And I'll quote them the price and we're off and running. So, yeah, I, I formed an agency basically around myself. And now I'm representing these other other women as well. Yeah, I was going to ask about because when, when I went to your website and I was looking at some of the media kits and stuff like that, uh, that you had, I went, it was uh, in Conte Entertainment. And I was like, oh, he's formed this company. Yeah. <laughs> but I yeah. didn't realize that the, uh, when, when I was reading, it, I didn't realize that you actually also represented other people. But that, yeah, I re that gives you a great response because maybe maybe if they don't want travel adventure stories, maybe they want a disability or they want some other. Uh, so they, now you have a, a range, a, a buffet for them. Yeah, exactly. And it's really tough to tell what, what colleges want. I was, I, I happened to hit it lucky with myself because my show is about travel and it's about wildlife and every college kid loves animals and every college kid wants to travel. Yeah. And so it was like the perfect, it's why my show has lasted for 15 years and been so successful because I happen to hit it lucky. Right. Uh, Traciana Graves doing civility, uh, anti-hazing, anti-sexual harassment. That She's been with me for almost 12 years and she hit it right. But then I've had other people I've represented that uh, that got nothing. And and it can, and college kids are really fickle. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I refuse to handle, but if I really was just into money, I'd handle a boy band. <laughs> of course, yeah. I get tons of gigs at colleges. I, I won't go there. <laughs> I have my pride, but you know, and, and it can change from year to year. Right. Sometimes right. I've hand I've, I've signed people that I thought were going to do great, and they've just totally bombed in the colleges. So you're, right. and the college market is always changing. And now what's happening, which is, I hate to say it, but COVID nineteen actually helped my business because I I moved everything. We moved everything to. Zoom. And um, so I've got this whole, in fact, that's what you're seeing me in now. Why so well lit? I've got this whole studio set up in my, uh, uh, to do Zoom shows. Right. And so I had to re-choreograph my show. I tried doing it on like a stage with, with, I brought in a professional film crew and it didn't work out, but Zoom worked out perfect with just a stationary camera. But instead of crawling across the stage, I'll take my fingers as I'm, you know, and, and kind right. of mimic it that way. And so I re-choreograph my show. And while I don't get my full price that I would get if I'm out on the road, I usually charge half to do a Zoom show. Right. But I don't have to travel. I don't have to go to a yeah. hotel. I don't have to get an airplane. I don't have to rent a car. And I can do multiple Zoom shows in a day. 
Well, that's and, what I was thinking. Yeah, because yeah, while well, it cuts back on the travel, and you can say yes, I can do your show on Friday. You know, in in, in California, virtually. Yeah. And then the yeah. next day, or the very next morning, six hours later, I can be doing an East Coast show. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just exactly what happens. And, and the other thing that's interesting is my wife is also an author. Uh, she, but she has just one book. Uh, and she, uh, but uh, she is a master weaver. So it's completely different than what I do. But she has a weaving book that's really quite successful. In fact, just got picked up by another publisher. Uh, but what she does is she does uh, weaving workshops and weaving training. And a lot of those places that used to bring her in didn't, wouldn't have a lot of money to bring, to fly her out to do it. Right. And so when we, I put together my studio, she bought the lights, I bought the camera. And so we have, she has her studio upstairs and I have my studio downstairs. And we've had times where we're almost double booked. Yeah. I'll do a show and then we'll run the lights up to her, her place. And then she'll do a show. Yeah. And, but it, you know, it worked out really well wow. for us to be doing these, the everything via zoom. And I think this year, you know, I I've got my vaccination. So I've done some in-person shows already. Uh, but I'm probably going to be about half and half. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to look at how the pandemic is. It's like, you couldn't get me to go to Mississippi right now. Right. Uh, yeah. But I might go to Vermont, you know, or I might go to Minnesota or someplace yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to take dates on a case by case basis, but anybody wants it via Zoom, we'll do it. And so it's been working out great that way. Oh, that's fan. Yeah, that is fantastic. I've, I've found myself as well that it's opened up the opportunity because it means, oh my God, I yes, I can do the show at short notice. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, exactly. I don't have to, it doesn't take me eight hours to get there or whatever. That uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, so let's go back to the logistics uh, for your books and, and okay. uh, how you found a publisher or how you got the books out there. It, like you found an editor somehow to work with. Was that yeah, I found an editor, I think, through Writer's wanted... Market. What's that? I, oh, I found my editor, I think, through Writer's Market. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a funny story that I have in my latest book about how I ended up. I'm actually indie published. And I, so I, I own a bunch of businesses. I used to own a phone company, but I have Encante Entertainment, which is my entertainment agency that books in colleges. And then Encante Press is my publishing company. Okay. And right. how that happened is, uh, and I blame this on Lori Rosen, the editor that I told you about at the very beginning, uh, on how she got me to write with all this detail. And the problem with all that detail is it made my first book, uh, Cool Creatures, Hot Planet, a, a a large book. It's 430 some pages long. It does have some photos in, the, in, the, in right. it, but it, it's, it's a large book. And publishers generally, for a first time author, they're looking for someone writing somewhere between 70,000 and 100,000 words. Yeah. This yeah. book is, my first book is 170,000 words, which is basically the same length as, as the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exactly. And so, her getting me to write with more detail, uh, what happened is publishers were interested, but they'd say, we want you to cut it down. It's too long. Right. And um, I refused to do it. And uh, because I, I, I liked the book the way it was, my editor liked the book the way it was, but it was too expensive, especially with photos in the middle for a first time author to get a right. deal with a publishing company. Yeah. So I started in Conte Press LLC, and it was really the best thing I ever did. Um, it, it worked out great. Uh, and kind of a funny thing is we, had, and I know some of this isn't, it, some people aren't going to be able to see this, but I actually have two different book covers. And uh, the first book, first book cover has this picture of a tailless whip scorpion, which is, looks like a spider crawling up my face. My wife, Deb, took it in the Amazon rainforest. And... <laughs> I, I did get major distribution uh, with Midpoint Trade out of uh, New York City. Yeah. Uh, I, ha I, had, I had everything set up really wonderfully. I was in all the bars. Oh, yeah, you Oval. said IBB, IBPA, which meant you were a member of the Independent Book Publishers Association, which meant exactly, you were yeah. behaving like a traditional publisher. Exactly. Yeah. And But what happened with this first book cover with the tail is whip scorpion on my eye uh, 
is Barnes and Noble, even though the book was selling well, in fact, the book sold out, the first publisher, first uh, uh, printing sold out, but Barnes and Noble started complaining because people would see this photo with this whip scorpion on my eye, they'd get scared and they'd run to the opposite side of Barnes and Noble. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, you know- They didn't even get it, to it, read the story yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it really, college students really liked it. And that, so that really helped me, that cover, helped me get into colleges because college students thought it was real cool. Oh, uh, after that sold out, I went to a, more, a friendlier uh, cover yeah. uh, with, with just a, with a frog and the world on it. And so we switched the cover, but you know, it was one of those things where, yeah, I have two different covers, but it's not because I regret doing the first cover, right. uh, but I, it helped me reach a different audience by switching covers after when I went to the second printing. Well, as an independent publisher, you can do that. You you yeah. have the ability to say this is the edition for these audiences, and I mean, uh, publishers, right, the biggest publishers in the world do that, where they go, okay, in in America, this romance novel is going to have a half naked guy with the abs and the chest, but in the UK, they want his clothes on, uh, exactly. Like, so because of the different audiences that they they just find different things appealing, I guess. Yeah, and and you know, and plus, you know, if you find a typo. I, I can I can have that typo fixed really quickly. Right. It, right. And uh, yeah, so you that, do, that's kind of nice too. Do you, I mean, obviously you, you did work to get uh, old boy school distribution through Midpoint, which is a major distributor through the US. Yeah. Um, how did, uh, in terms of eBooks now that they're a uh, thing and, and print books, is it still, because nonfiction books do better in, in print typically or, or or has eBooks taken off for you as well? Yeah, I, th I, I you know, I, it's hard to tell because a cool creatures hot planet uh, came out just when ebooks were becoming a thing. Yeah. Uh, so that was what uh, 11, 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, so I definitely it sold probably more print than I have ebooks of that one. Right. I, I also at colleges, you know, when, uh, you know, even though colleges pay me separately to go in, it doesn't matter if I sell any books, I always bring books. Yeah. And so, I sell a lot of books at colleges because everybody, you know, they get a signed copy right there. And, uh, and so I, I've sold a lot of, a lot of them that way. Uh, now with my fiction books, I'm definitely selling more ebook uh, than I am paperback. Yeah. I want to get into that in a second too, because I want to ask you about the difference for, for that writing something completely different uh -huh. Monty Python style. But um <laughs> you did obviously you did offset print runs in the early days before using print on demand or how how do you do those yeah prints? i did yeah uh, for cool creatures hot print planet i used freezins out of canada okay uh and they did a great job uh for uh, endangered edens uh this book is it's a shorter book but the difference is it's all color high quality color on glossy paper wow that uh, is expensive it, yeah. And in fact, one of my favorite reviews on this book was somebody who wrote a review and said, I bought two copies, one to read, one to cut out the photos so I could, so I could frame them. Wow. And so it's printed <laughs> on photo quality paper. And that I had to do in China uh, because it was the only way I could get the print cost down enough because I didn't want to charge more than 1999 right, right. or 1995. And so I, I sent it out to China and uh, and I worked with actually an American company that specialized in that uh, called uh, four color uh, four color prints I think is what it's called wow. and uh, they were great to work with and we sent it out to China and um, it, and the book came back absolutely beautiful. Um, there's a whole other story I could get into that maybe we don't have time for though. <laughs> and I switched distributors and I won't tell you who I switched to. <laughs> and they totally dropped the ball on that second book. Oh, and man. so I still have quite a few boxes <laughs> of the book in my basement uh, that uh, will be there and probably till I die. I, I do give the book out to charity organizations, right. uh, environmental organizations. They're doing a fundraiser and stuff. But the second book, uh, mostly because my distributor, I mean, I would be on a book tour out in New York and I I'd, I'd have given my distributor uh two months notice that I'm going to be at such and such bookstore in New York. And I'd show up and the bookstore manager would be just pissed saying I had to go buy books off of Amazon because your distributor didn't get them to me. And, uh, and so I had, I, I should have stayed with midpoint trade, 
Right. Uh, but I went with this other distributor because I thought they were even going to be better, and it was a stupid mistake on my part. <laughs> well, when we're offline, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some educated guesses on who that might be, but we're not going to share that because we don't say bad yeah, things. Yeah, I, in fact, I talk about my book. I'm not telling anyone because I don't want to get sued. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to get sued. They were horrible. Um, okay, so let's get into we 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 tease the audience. So you wrote this book, Time is Irreverent. Yeah, and it is. So you've gone from writing. Uh, world travel, adventure, ecological, like all of these things, which yeah. are completely unique and fun uh, genre, to science fiction political comedy. So first of all, what is time is uh, irreverent? Like what, okay. what's the premise of this? Uh, this well, you know, first of all, you know, the reason, one of the reasons I switch is because going out and traveling is expensive. You know, <laughs> that, that first book, if, you, if, if I counted the travel, you know, it, yeah, I don't even, it, a lot of money to travel all seven continents. So right, yeah, yeah. You, you just can't keep doing that. Uh, and, but, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I, uh, in every book that I write uh, advocates for protecting the environment and protecting human rights. So all of my books basically, you know, they're, they're political in that way. Right. And so the very first book I tried to write, uh, which failed, I mean, every, I think probably everybody got through this. I, I, I got this idea years and years ago that I wanted to write a book where I had my protagonist somehow through time travel go back to the time of Christ and interact with, with, with people there and then come back to present time and open up the Bible and that person had taken the place of Christ. Okay. And I tried to write it and it was a total failure. I didn't have the chops to do it. But <laughs> after I wrote these first two nonfiction books, I think I got to be a much better writer. And now I finally felt comfortable doing dialogue. And so I kind of took that general idea with time is irreverent and really expanded on it. And um, so, yeah, my, my character does go back to the time of Christ. And, but it's also political in that I have a, a character, um, uh, President Handley, uh, which is everybody's going to read and say, yeah, it's Donald Trump. And I got the name Hanley because Handley. they used to make fun of, of Donald Trump's small hands. So that's how he got named. And so this is president that's dropping nuclear bombs. And so for the time travel aspect, I have these aliens that have, have the, the capability of time travel. They come to investigate and they're good aliens. And, uh, and so my characters end up, uh, my two main protagonists end up going back uh, to the time of Christ. And so it, it, it has become quite a controversial book uh, because the you religious right, a few people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, the religious right does not like my book, do not like my books. And uh, I, uh, the reviews on Amazon, I, I mean, it's mostly positive, but if you look up my, any, I have three Time is Irreverent books, Time is Irreverent 1, and then Time is Irreverent 2, uh, subtitled Jesus Christ, Not Again. And that's where they bring they bring Jesus Christ to present time, and Jesus Christ is a liberal <laughs> and doesn't like guns. Probably not and, a white guy either. <laughs> not a white, not a white guy, and uh, and uh, and of course they crucify him here in present time as well. Yeah. Uh, but we have a way to get him out of that. And so, but Jesus comes back uh, uh, through time travel and become and. And so uh, some people really like my version of Jesus. I like my version of Jesus, but it's not that it's not your, it's not your, your mom and pa's version of Jesus. Um, and then I, my, my third book uh, is also time travel it involves Jesus, but it also involves going back and kidnapping Ronald Reagan, going back in time and kidnapping Ronald Reagan, and then bringing Ronald Reagan into the future. You mean Ronald so, Reagan when he was an actor or when he was a president? So Ronald Reagan when he was first president. So they go back and kidnap him and then bring him into the future so he can see what he started with his anti-environmental policies oh. that have carried on through the Republican Party. And he can see what has happened to planet Earth with what he started. Right. And so those are, and so you can see the, the people on the right aren't going to like what I write. And so I've had book reviews uh, uh, that just say Trump 2020. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> 2024 now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that was, and so if you look at my reviews, it's either five star reviews or one star reviews. Yeah. Very yeah. little in between. 
<laughs> in just fact, because you one, dared to do this. Yeah. It, in fact, there was one. In fact, I had to, uh, with Amazon, uh, there was a group of people that were obviously just doing fake reviews. They hadn't read the book. Yeah. yeah. And within like a week, about 20 one-star reviews, horrible reviews went up. And, and all actually, kind of copied and pasted from the same meme, right? Basic, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I finally went to Amazon and they, they, they agreed, yeah, these aren't real reviews and they took them down. Yeah. So yeah, the books are real controversial, but they're funny too. I mean, it's, it's satire. Yeah. And, but I do have uh, on, you know, whether it's on Kobo or whether it's on Amazon or wherever I have it, if you go to the, to the, to the book pages, you go to the bottom, I have a publisher's warning. Um, yeah, yeah, and just warning people. Yeah, this these are liberal books, <laughs> and you know if if you're into Donald Trump or you're into you know far far right conservative Christian Christianity, you're not going to like my books. Don't buy them. Yeah, go, <laughs> so, go 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 look over there. <laughs> yeah, so it, I'm kind of this awkward situation where I'm trying to sell my books at the same time I'm telling people not to buy my books because yeah. <laughs> you know I I had that at first I I thought. Hey, you all convert these people. I'll get them to think, and you you just can't. You just can't. You'd have more yeah. luck surviving an attack of uh, some wild animal in in the African rainforest, yeah. <laughs> which you have survived. Uh, yeah, which I we have. don't have time to get into, but I I do want to make sure that there will be links for my listeners to your website where there's some the hippo story. There's uh, Canadian wolves. There's so many cool stories to share. But Marty. Um, I am curious because we're, we're getting close to, to wrap okay. up time is what is next for you? You've done, you know, you've, you've toured, you're doing the virtual stuff. You've done the, the nonfiction books. You've done fiction. What's next on your plate? I don't know. <laughs> I had an idea and you had inspired it. I was reading uh, your book wide for the win. I, uh, um, and you had this whole thing on doing um, Kickstarter. And I had never thought about it. Well, I had, but I have too much of an ego to actually have someone pay for my book. Uh, and I, so I've never done that. I've never asked anybody for money, but I wanted to do, uh, last week, my wife and I went to a place called the American Prairie Reserve. Uh, it's in central Montana. It is an amazing place, but what they're doing is they're taking private land and buying private land around public land to make the biggest, basically the biggest uh, wilderness area uh, in the United States, uh, and it's one of the four untouched prairie, prairie uh, uh, ecosystems in the world, right. and I wanted to write a book on that, and I thought, well, that one, because it is going to be real expensive, and it's not going to have a huge market, uh, you had inspired me to go in and maybe do it as a Kickstarter, but I really needed to get the American Prairie Reserve involved in it, right. so I had this whole idea for the book, and then I talked to the American Prairie Reserve, had this really nice meeting with really nice people. And they have two other people there that are writing the same book. Oh, no. And so, so it's like, no, you know, we'd love to have you do it, but you're too late. So, uh, but it was an idea. Uh, I might go back and do Time as Irreverent 4 now. Uh, but oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, uh, it was and, but now I've got the Kickstarter idea. And I'm, you know, if I find another project like that, it would have to be, you know, some project where I'm benefiting some, ecological place yeah uh, that we, where i wouldn't necessarily sell thousands and thousands of books but it might it, but it would be for a good cause now that would be a time to do kickstarter or do uh, different types of funding so that was something your book really opened my eyes open to and i'm gonna you know keep that in mind uh as i'm looking at other projects i appreciate that so marty now that we've teased everyone uh, that wants to go check uh, check things out about you where where can they find you online? Where can they find uh, your books, your audiobooks, print books, ebooks? Okay, well, my ebooks are everywhere. Uh, uh, all, the big five, you know, uh, uh, all, everybody has my ebooks, uh, and I, same thing with 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 the any anybody that has print, uh, it's it's available everywhere. Uh, not necessarily your local bookstore, although they can certainly order it. Uh, my website is the same as my name. It's www.martyessen.com that's m-a-r-t-y-e-s-s-e-n.com or if you put a dash between my two names marty dash essen that will go to my blog and uh my blog is more political and i have photos and, and and things like that and that changes every single day but on my website um i do have if you click the video section on my website 
Um, I did a show, a sold out show at the University of Montana, brought in a professional film crew. And there are excerpts from that show, as we, we talked about, uh, where I was up in Canada and got surrounded by wolves, which was just an amazing adventure. I got attacked by a hippo uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, uh, had this great adventure with humpback whales down in Antarctica. So people can uh, click on any of those videos and hear the whole story as I perform it in my show around the world in 90 minutes. Awesome. Well, Marty, thank you for slowing down this world travel that you do to talk to me for about 40 minutes. My pleasure. Minutes. It was such a pleasure to talk to you, and I look forward to your next project. Thank you. Bye. So there's two things I wanted to reflect on uh, from this conversation with Marty. And it was the first thing where he recognized a weakness, so turning a weakness into a strength. And, and, and Marty recognized the weaknesses. Like, eh, I've never really been all that good at reading. So when I go on book tour, I don't want to bore them to death with a reading. I'm not comfortable doing it anyway. So he applied his skill as a photographer, etc., and did a slideshow and a talk, which he refined into a very, you know, renowned and respected talk that uh, continues uh, to, to gain him audiences uh, throughout the U.S. as he travels to colleges in particular and gives that talk. And and that's kind of interesting because I, I love it when a creative person can take something where they recognize, okay, I'm not so good at this. And, and, and whether it's, uh, I need an editor who can help my writing do this, so I recognize I have this weakness, so I need that help, or I, I'm not good at this, so I need to hire someone to help me with this thing. And he's doing the same sort of thing, saying, okay, I need to do this, and I'm not comfortable doing that. I don't think I'm good at this, but I think I can do that, particularly with this background. Yeah, I can do that. I have done this. I understand how this works and applying it. And then it kind of reminded me of this conversation that my partner Liz and I had about talks that are... So what, what Marty does is it's a performance. It's, it's a play where he's memorized all of the lines verbatim, and I love that he talks about delivering, you know, he's, he's, he's performing the same, we called it blocking in theater. He's performing the same blocking movements where he's in a particular spot when he delivers a certain line or he says a certain thing or he's crawling across the stage or whatever. And that is perfect theatrical. And when Liz and I have seen speakers that are obviously not, um, you know, just doing a talk off the top of their heads, but are actually doing what is a memorized perfected performance and and i do admire i want to pause for a second and say i love the fact that marty's like well i i don't have it perfect yet and that's what keeps me interested is i want to nail it i want to keep trying it so he's constantly working at that which is again what we do as writers anyways but but back to that where when when liz watches something like that she she doesn't enjoy it because she feels it's not authentic it you know and and and, and, and I always come back uh, on that and say, yes, it's a performance, but it's a consistent performance where they are deliver delivering exactly what the audience paid to be there for. Or if it was not a paid event, let's say it's a free event, but it's being paid by the college or whatever. The audience is expecting a performance and they're getting a performance and it's been perfected and, and honed and polished as opposed to just show up and blah, blah, blah. Not that there's anything wrong with showing up and talking, because I've, I've seen amazing speakers who are able to do that. I do prefer ad lib uh, in, in many of the things that I do. And I have done theater, and I've memorized things for theater. But I love this concept, because in my mind, even if this is a rehearsed performance that has been done thousands of times, so, so the thing I came back to with Liz is, so when we see, you know, Hamlet on stage at uh, Stratford Festival in Stratford, Ontario, because we don't live in <laughs> London, in England, <laughs> we have the, the smaller Stratford that's nearby. When Hamlet is doing his soliloquy or is verklempt over the death of Ophelia or, or whatever, whatever is happening, is it any less authentic because it's an actor on stage pretending? Or when we watch a an actor, well, a stage is different because they do perform the same thing over and over and over again in, in front of different audiences. Whereas when it's for film, it's shot once and, and, and recorded. But when we see an actor uh, feeling sad or angry or happy or any of the things that they do, is it any less authentic just because the person is acting? No, they're there to deliver something that's meant to make us feel, think, inspire, whatever. And And I hold the same true for 
for people who are delivering uh, talks on stage. What created the content, the experiences Marty shares, are authentic, real experiences that he is sharing. And it, and it kind of leads back to some of the things I did in customer service when I, when I worked in customer service. And I remember it was the old fish philosophy of customer service. And I remembered this from working at the bookstore at McMaster University where I was working on the sales floor, even though I was the operations manager, I'm everyone, all hands on deck, working on the sales floor, helping first year students when they come in trying to figure out what textbooks they need to buy. And I would, you know, be standing in front of a skit of, you know, psychology textbooks, for example, first year psychology textbooks. And I would answer the same question, I'm not kidding, at least three to 500 times the exact same question a day. And rather than be bored and dry with the response that I gave, which was very similarly the same response, I delivered my response as if it was the first time I had ever heard that question and I was giving them the authentic answer rather than rolling my eyes and going to Detroit here or whatever the answer is. Because the person who approached me and asked that question had a genuine question and they honestly did not know the answer to it and that's why they were asking it. So I genuinely gave them a response even though it was a response that I had given a thousand times before. And I gave it as if it was the first time because I wanted it to be a organic experience, natural experience. But it also kept it, even though I was delivering the same line, I would have fun with it and I would and I would put energy into it as if I was performing that same line, that same monologue, that's the same dialogue from Shakespeare, for example, to a different audience. I wanted to impress them with the knowledge and information. They were asking for something and I gave them what they wanted, but I it was, did it in a performance-based way and, and tried to perfect my craft at that. And I don't think it was inauthentic because I was actually helping them. And I believe that even a speaker who has memorized their speech and has nailed it down to stepping here and looking this way and gesturing that way as they say a certain line, it is authentic. It was created authentically. And it's being delivered in front of a different audience in a very authentic way, even if it has been done a thousand times before. I'm curious what your thoughts, dear listener, about that sort of authenticity. Because I I am very much wanting to be authentic when I'm on stage. Now, one of the things I will do, of course, is there will be times where I have delivered the same talk. Not necessarily memorized in any way, shape, or form. The same talk where I will interact with the audience, but I'll still deliver the same jokes. Uh, and feel the audience out and, and adjust accordingly. But I'm curious about your thoughts. But anyways, that's it for this episode, these reflections of the Stark Reflections podcast. I hope you found the interview with Marty entertaining and interesting and inspiring. I hope you found the reflections inspiring and entertaining. Feel free to leave your own reflections over at starkreflections.ca in the show notes for episode 201. And uh, if you like the podcast, feel free to please share it with a friend that you think would find value in it. I'm always eager to get reviews on the podcast and leave a review over on the podcatcher of your choice. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre thanking you so much for listening. And until we chat again, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.